Welcome everyone. I'm Patricia Kranz, the Executive Director of the Overseas Press Club of America. We are delighted to present tonight another installment of our new How We Did It uh, series showcasing journalists who have done prize-winning work. Tonight we are presenting a program about the bitter work behind Sugar, a radio story and podcast by Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, which won this year's Morton Frank Award for Best International Business News Reporting in broad TV, et cetera, <laughs> broadcast. It was distributed by PRX and a text version was published in Mother Jones. Moderating the conversation is OPC Governor Marina Walker, who is executive editor of the Pulitzer Center. She spent 15 years at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, where she managed the two largest collaborations of reporters in journalism history, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. So Marina, with that, I turn it over to you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I am honored to moderate this important conversation in the How We Did It series by the Overseas Press Club. The conversation today, as Patty said, will focus on Sandy Tolan and Euclides Cordero Noel's investigation, the bitter work behind sugar, which revealed the abuses Haitian workers endure in sugar cane harvesting camps in the Dominican Republic. With information from visits to 10 work camps, also known as FATES, and more than 100 interviews, as well as numerous documents from government agencies and lawsuits, the reporting team traced sugar from the Dominican Republic to American ports and to the supply chain of some of the some major brands uh, in the US, such as Domino and Hershey. The report was a probe into Central Romana Corporation a privately held sugar producing company partially owned by a prominent Cuban American family, the Fanjuls. The story shows how the Fanjuls built a global sugar empire through a secretive web of holding companies, partnerships and affiliates, including a major importer of sugar into the United States. The reporting which prompted a scrutiny from Congress and also the Department of Labor documented workers earning a four day, a four dollar a day uh, wages, is having a staggering debt, facing substandard housing, and, and really having a very difficult uh, time accessing any kind of uh, medical care. All of this while helping build the company's profits. Now let me introduce briefly our distinguished speakers. Uh, Sandy Tolan is here with us. He's a radio and print journalist and the author of three books. I, Euclides uh, Cordero Noel, uh, let me uh, make sure he hasn't joined us yet, but he will join us very uh, soon. He's facing a, a situation in his country, um, but Euclides is an independent journalist based in the Dominican Republic. And with us today is um, Michael Montgomery, who is a senior producer for Reveal from the Center uh, for Investigative Reporting and also had a very important role in this story as executive producer of the revealed piece. Um, what else? So the format today for this conversation, I will kick it off uh, with our three guests. Uh, and after about 25, 30 minutes, we'll open up for questions from you. So I encourage you to please send your questions in the chat. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts, your input um, uh, at the time of the Q&A. So without further ado, I will start with you, Sandy. And I guess my first question is uh, the backstory. So what are the origins of this investigation? Can you uh, tell us how it all started? Thank you. And uh, Euclides is trying to join us now. Um, and just a note to one of our colleagues, Chad, if you uh, can possibly reach out to him, um, he might need a little help. He's trying to join right now. So yes, thank you. First of all, thank you to OPC. It's good to be here with my colleague and soon uh, my other colleague with Michael and, and soon Euclides and Marina. Thanks so much for doing this. And, and thank you, Patricia, for the introduction. So um, this story actually had origins um, in the early 1990s when uh, several 
partners uh, and I produced a series called Vanishing Homelands for NPR. And my colleague, Alan Wiseman and I uh, traveled to the Dominican Republic to look at the situation involving sugarcane cutters back in that time. Um, there was, the situation was so terrible then that um, I, I, I'd scarcely ever seen anything like it. There were child, uh, there were child workers, um, you know, in the, their early teens or even younger. Some had been kidnapped. There were people, uh, grown-ups and children locked behind gates, being protected by armed guards and essentially forced to cut sugarcane. It was uh, hardly distinguishable from slavery and the conditions were absolutely horrific. Uh, the amount of mo money the people made, the f you know, they were getting a dollar a ton at the time per ton of, of raw cane that they cut. Uh, and so during that time I met a child, um, my, my partner Alan and I met a child named Lulu Pierre who was 14 years old at the time and had been forced, uh, he'd been kidnapped on the border and forced to cut cane. And it was really such an appalling situation uh, that, you know, it, it was one of those moments when as a journalist, you are confronted with something beyond journalism and you sort of have to decide what to do. And, and we, we saw a situation where we might be able to help by giving this translator, this Catholic brother from Canada, uh, some money to help get him home. We never found out what happened to Lulu Pierre, um, and we went on. We went on to interview the amb U.S. ambassador, and we produced our story in, in the early '90s. And um, and I never found out what happened in all those years. For almost thirty years, I was haunted by the the memory of this child that was kidnapped and wondering what would happen to him. So one day, finally, after almost thirty years in in the early uh, 2019. I decided to go back and um, and find out. And that's when I met this remarkable man named Euclides Cordero Noel, who uh, some mutual uh, who I'm so happy to see on the on the screen right now. Uh, and we began to work together. Our first uh, thought, our first assignment essentially was to try to find out what happened to Euclides and see if we could, I mean, excuse me, to, to Lulu Pierre and see if we could actually do a story about what happened to him. Uh, long story short, uh, spoiler alert, uh, we didn't find him. We have not yet found him. Uh, and we were coming back to a place where I hadn't been since Euclides himself, who can tell you more about how he was raised, but he was only two years old the first time I was there. And we didn't find, Euclid uh, we didn't find Lulu, but what we did find was a story of continuing appalling conditions uh, despite the improvements, uh, the situation facing Haitian sugarcane cutters remains quite appalling and we could get into those details as we go forward. Thank you so much, Sandy, and welcome, uh, Euclides. We're so happy you are with us today. I already introduced you briefly when before you arrived, but I would like to ask you now what it was like for you um, to work on this story, to be uh, invited by, by Sandy to join this reporting team, um, having grown, having been raised in one of these uh, campsites and having worked in the sugarcane fields yourself when you were younger. What was it like to work on the story? Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, what, did you I'm, hear the question? I'm sorry for the uh, delay, but I was, um, was very challenging to uh, uh, log in. That's why I no had problem. to uh, download uh, the the. I I had before downloaded, but it asked me to download again, and I had to wait and all of that. I want to say sorry for that. No problem at all. We are already live, and we are going on with this webinar. We are so glad you joined. Um, did you have a chance to hear the the question I I asked you about what what was your experience like of working on this uh, story? That in some ways was so personal to you or to your to your personal um, history. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and um, good afternoon. My name is Euclides Cordero Noel. 
I'm a journalist from the Dominican Republic. Uh, I want to start by saying that it was a honor to me uh, to be working with the, uh, in this investigation about the country sugar industry because it's a subject that has been very um, uh, tied to explored in a journalistic term. Uh, because of the enormous power of the uh, economic and political influence that the sugar company has in Dominican Republic today. Not today, but um, um, uh, year by years, for years, for generation, I can say. Exactly. So uh, when I met Sandy Tolan in uh, May 2019 in Santo Domingo, and he told me about the um, Lulu history um, as a, as a uh, skinny boy who had been uh, kidnapping in the uh, uh, northern of uh, the border in Dominican Republic in Haiti and the Habon exactly, uh, the location where he was kidnapped. Uh, working with the machete, he did not know exactly how to throw the machete into the cane. Um, uh, he doesn't know how to, to uh, cut the cane. And um, uh, Sandy was very passionate in the, uh, at the time he was uh, telling me that. And um, I get, I get, so that, that, that uh, um, touched me very deep in uh, to hear that because I, I, I thought about me in that moment, about my, when I was very, uh, when, when I was a child in the Abate uh, growing up and working in the, uh, uh, once for the, uh, with the, the machete uh, in the cane field. That I, so I, re, I had a remind in that time about the situation. There was probably nobody better positioned than you, Euclides, to to do this work and to and to do this important reporting. So I'm so uh -huh. glad that you and I'm so glad that you and Sandy connected. And uh, Sandy, so uh, from what you and Euclides have said, you know the initial focus was on Lulu Pierre, but then that didn't pan out, and your story shift uh, as it happens to so many journalists in the field. Uh, was that a hard, a hard shift? Uh, uh, was it a, a natural, organic thing that in, in allowed you to to tackle the more systemic story? Exactly, because uh, in the in the very energetic narrative of uh, Sandy Tolan, I saw I saw like I made a flashback when I was growing up at the party and said, "Oh, that could be me too, also," and. Um, and I also remind uh, uh, when I was uh, about to be done with my uh, high school to study in the university because I was thinking about to study anthropology. And I was one year in the uh, university studying anthropology. And after that, I decided to uh, study a uh, um, uh, journalism because it's, it's what I feel inside of me, doing like talking to the people and um, um, write histories and, and work with the uh, 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 for histories of, uh, and the way uh, um, Sandy have, um, uh, I can say Sandy has been at the same time a uh, professor for me on the ground because he have a very, um, uh, a, a powerful energy, and um, I think people get very open and open wide to talk with us when um, when we ask the people to uh, talk about the situation because they feel they could uh, change something. It's a little thing, but yeah. something could change if they talk to us. So uh, uh, finally. And our um, exploration looking for Lulu, uh, we could not find Lulu. And uh, yeah. Uh, however, Sandy uh, realized uh, that a little have changed since he was here in, in 
um, in, in 91 and began to work on a, an idea for this research. Uh, I was also uh, very interested in working on because uh, I know it was a way to publicize the difficulties that the uh, the situation of the workers and the family and this and uh, working in the sugar cane plantation. Yeah, and I think, I think please is, let me just add to this if I can. The the um, the emphasis that we had was always to to try to see if we could find Lulu, but also not simply to have a a retrospective piece and what happened to this person that I happened to meet 30 years ago. Exactly. But what's yes. the difference now? Mm -hmm. And and clearly uh -huh. there have been differences. There have been improvements. Um, there isn't, you know, the, the amount of, of people who are children who are working in the fields or people who are being locked up and literally forced to, to cut sugarcane has diminished sharply. But the conditions that one of the things that we did as we pivoted and as we, you know, worked very closely together, you know, as colleagues uh, side by side, um, with Euclides' experience, uh, without it, I, I would have never been able to get the story that we together produced with Michael and with our colleagues. So it was at the, at some point when we realized we're probably not going to find Lulu, then we went deeper into the story, the part of the story we were already going to do, which is looking at this vast plantation in the Dominican Republic, which is... Uh, almost a quarter million acres and is largely owned uh, and, and, and controlled by this uh, family in uh, Florida, these sugar barons in Florida, uh, very wealthy, who's by some instruments, uh, the family earns more than $100 million a year in profits. And we're finding these workers who are paid $4 a day, who have these insurmountable debt schemes who are absolutely trapped in poverty, you know, I've been all over the world. I've reported in 40 some countries and I've never seen uh, conditions. I mean, I'm talking about Gaza and places like that that are worse um, than, the, than the Haitian workers. These people who are really good, hardworking, strong people, but who have so many disadvantages. And so once we began to see that, you please, and I traveling throughout uh, this vast plantation of Central Romana, we realize that this is really where the story is. Even if we don't find Lulu Pierre, and I'm, I'm, I'm determined someday to, to go back with Euclides and, and look again. Um, but right now, um, I, the fact that, that we have that we found this other story and what's happening now remains so relevant. Sandy, thank you for that. And we'll talk more about the challenges you both faced in the field and the decisions you had to make. I want to bring in uh, Michael and ask you, Michael, as an editor and executive producer for the reveal piece, what were your initial concerns when you when you got this pitch? Uh, did you imme immediately buy into it or did you have some hesitations? Yeah, so yeah, I, I edited this and, and was sort of a co-producer with Sandy. I was not the executive producer, um, but you know, it's it's one of those things where, obviously, Sandy and Euclides were developing powerful stories with these uh, uh, cane cutters and their families who live in these work camps, these bates. These are Haitian people who've come from Haiti, so they're migrants. They're extremely at risk. Um, so just getting to that point was extremely difficult and showed uh, how good Sandy and Euclides were at developing trust and all that. The, the, the issue though, I think beyond Lulu Pierre was they were developing you know, uh, uh, examples or anecdotes of these, this situation. And what we were interested in is trying to connect this back to the United States where a lot of the sugar is exported to, as Sandy, uh, you referred to at the top, brands like Domino and Hershey it feeds into their supply chains. And that makes this story very important because it connects all of us to these abuses. The, the key thing, just to sort of fast forward, the key thing in Sandy's reporting was he was develop, able to develop information that uh, US government officials were aware of the situation, not only aware of the situation, but they uh, 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 believed, or there was information that suggests that uh, US officials believed that the, the, the the company that really was the worst performer in this in terms of a failure to implement reforms 
was this central Romana corporation. So once we figured out, okay, there is information within inside government that's going to corroborate these findings on the ground, that to me was key. And as you mentioned, we eventually through a lawsuit, the Department of Labor got our hands on some of those documents, which exactly corroborated what Sandy and Euclides were finding. And Michael, in, in the effort to create like a really solid backbone of documents and data for this investigation, you also took uh, another approach, which was quite fascinating to me, which is you created a survey uh, that um, I understand Euclides uh, uh, and others uh, did, uh, you know, in the Bates, even before some of the field reporting began. Can you tell us about that decision? Because I think that that can be something that other journalists can, can learn from. Right. I mean, and this is really, uh, this was really Sandy and Euclides' work and their idea. But, it, you know, how do you create a data set if you're not really going to get, have access to government data? I mean, one of the one of the problems here is, is these, these areas are neglected by the government of the Dominican Republic. So there isn't a lot of data or certainly not a lot of government data that we could get our hands on. And so um, with, with some help from some experts on forced labor, uh, uh, Sandy and Euclides put together a, a questionnaire, an informal survey, which I think was really important uh, in, in getting, you know, Sandy, you, you, you take it from here, 50 people, 50 cane cutters who who, who helped us hit certain notes, like there's a whole criteria that the International Labor Organization uh, puts together about forced labor. And through those surveys, we saw that, for example, debt was a huge issue, debt that these people couldn't get out of, medical issues, exposure to, to, to pesticides, herbicides. So that really helped us see a more systemic picture of these abuses. Right. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I mean, one of the things that was most striking um, it was it was a few days before I was going to be coming out to join Euclides, and he and another colleague. I think you you all went to like at least seven different, maybe more than that, uh, different bates, and I think, as I recall, met with forty eight different people. And so, what this first of all, it was it was almost like a pre reporting. It was a pre reporting to figure out where we were going to go and who we were going to talk to but also to see what was the emphasis that we needed to, this is my third trip, this was going to be my third trip, we were trying to nail it down. And all of a sudden what came up was, you know, from one of our themes was almost everyone was in debt. And the debt scheme was um, unbelievable almost. They are paying interest rates of 500% per year. And this is common. It is not run by Central Romana. That's an important distinction. But nevertheless, it's run by local loan sharks uh, as a side business. We interviewed, uh, remember Euclides, we interviewed uh, a fireman, uh, you know, who had the side business of 500% interest. I mean, it's how people make money. But it, what it means is that some of the human rights reports, it underscores this point that these folks, these, these amazing, hardworking Haitian people who work in the sun all day and don't have electricity or running water, or even enough food to eat, they're trapped. They're trapped in debt. I don't know if you, you want to add. Go ahead, Maria. So I, hey, Clides, I, I wanted to ask you uh, precisely about, about these interactions with the workers. How do they feel about uh, interacting with journalists and especially with foreign journalists? And how did you earn their trust? I think uh, the people, you know, um, because of my uh, uh, Haitian uh, culture, I know exactly how to introduce myself and also um, uh, 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 introduce my partner, okay. in this case, Sandy. So um, I warmly um, uh, say hi and also uh, feel myself very comfortable in a, in a very vulnerable uh, uh, tiny room, but uh, with dignity to be standing there and talking to the people uh, there. I, I remember I remember a thing that happened in Abate. Um, uh, and, uh, we was talking to uh, two guys, two elderly guys. And um, 
Sandy was interviewing him and he was talking to us. He was he was uh, saying what he feel inside because he saw how his life is crumbling without any money. He have worked, he has worked on many years in the sugar cane and he have any money. He have he can he could not save any money for his long working in the sugar cane. So the tears come out of his eyes in that time and he um he uh um comes his mach he crashed his machete and that's why he has machete. Ground. Yeah. yeah on the ground like and he was the 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 um um the tears uh come out of his face and you can see how um a uh, uh, indignado he feel about that situation because he's 60 uh, something right now and he have anything only a tiny room to live and is he, and it is not his own room it's because he's the it's on to the company you can imagine that so he as he make um um a, a request for his pension but he could not have that. He have like 20 years, I think he said, um, fighting for his pension. It's a right he have to have his pension back because he paid uh, peso by peso every, every week for that. So now he need it, he doesn't have any access to it. And the company is very powerful. They could help him to have that, but is that they are not interested in uh, uh, have a better life for the people. You just work in here and you get old without money, you elderly now, so we need you home to put another uh, very fresh guy, uh, very strong guy, because you're not good anymore for our company. That's very unfair. I mean, uh, yeah, I think Michael wants to chime in. I just want to add to that because because that is a very powerful moment in the radio documentary when Sandy and Euclides are interviewing these two gentlemen, and so you have elderly men who are still having to work in the cane fields because they can't get their pensions that they've paid into because they're essentially stateless as Haitians in the Dominican mm -hmm. Republic, and we've seen a lot of stories about the situation for Haitians living in the Dominican Republic. And it's 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 a really serious situation. Just a reminder that the cane that these people cane sugar, the, the cane that sugar cane that these people cut is processed and much of it comes to the United States and ends up in our breakfast table. So there's you know there is this direct connection. And the only other thing I want to say is Euclides was vital in this because Euclides speaks English, he speaks Spanish, but he also speaks Haitian Creole. And that language connection is an essential ingredient in building trust. And I think it's something for a lot of younger reporters to keep in mind that, you know, it's if you're coming from outside a country, you really need to understand the culture. You need to speak the language. You need to find other ways, collaborating with other uh, journalists from the area to, to get those connections. These are people who are extremely at risk and they're taking yeah. chances to talk with you. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Uh, sorry, Euclides, just for a second. I just would add to that. Euclides, uh, you can tell from his just how he is. I mean, his warmth, his humanity. It's not just that he knows how to speak Haitian Creole and Spanish uh, and English, but but also that he makes people comfortable. And the thing is, when you're interviewing people, you you know, I always, I often tell my students, you want you want the person you're interviewing to go from from this crossing their arms to this being open and and Euclides does that almost immediately. Um, and, you know, we were interviewing these old, these old guys. I mean, we were interviewing, we went into the field with another gentleman, 75 years old, on the first day of the harvest, he's just slashing away. There are people working into their 80s. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. And it's, it's appalling. Um, but also, what happened to us, what happened to that man, as he was pounding a machete into the dirt, which you can hear when you listen to the radio program, five minutes later, these guys showed up, these guards showed up, 
with 38 uh, Smith and Wethersons on their belt and kicked us out. And that, that's, a, that's a whole other story. That's a, I, my next uh, question, Sandy, is like the surveillance uh, that you uh, all endured in the field. Like, so this is a company that on, on one hand, very private, don't want to engage with reporters, was not forthcoming when you were trying to get your questions answered, but then you go in the field and you constantly, you know, they are, you know, on your, you know, on your tracks. So how, how did you manage to avoid uh, that kind of pressure and surveillance and also protect your sources, the people who were opening up to you? Well, I, I'll, I'll say something and I'm sure Euclides uh, uh, can add quite a bit, but um, one of the things that, that um, we realized when we got kicked out, we were already quite wary because they made it clear that Central Romana would, would not speak with us. They would not give us a tour. We, we tried many ways to, to get to talk to them. They would only communicate by email. To this day, they, they've only communicated with us by email. But um, after that first time, we got kicked out as fairly early in our reporting process. And, you know, we were a, a bit rattled and we, we got out of there. First, we tried to uh, go to the, the headquarters and, and ask them, why are you doing this? We, we, we think we have the right to be here. We've been in touch with people. That did nothing. And then um, I, we, we were driving and all of a sudden the phone rang and it was somebody from a rival sugar company. They're all kind of worked together who actually happens to be a cousin of the PR guy that we were dealing with at Central Romano, who, who asked you, called you please and said, oh, I hear Sandy Tolan's in the country. Well, I hadn't told anybody I was going to be in the country. Like I hadn't told anybody in Central Romano that we were there. So we all, and then I called a, a former U.S. ambassador to the country and, and he said, oh, I can't talk to you while you're there um, because I don't care what software you have. I don't care what app you have and how encrypted it is. Nothing's encrypted. Um, and so we all of a sudden realized we need to be very, very quick about this. We, it happened a couple of other times when we got kicked out, but we would go, we would park behind houses, park, park behind trees. We would try to just stay for 10 or 20 minutes um, or half an hour max. A couple of times, remember Euclides, we turned off, we, we went into airplane mode. Um, because we were really concerned that we were being followed. And, you know, it, it wasn't in this case, you know, sometimes it's paranoia, but in this case, it was actually practical. So what one of the disadvantages is we, we didn't get the life stories sometimes that we wanted with those long interviews you do and you get into the history and why did you come and how do you feel right when we were asking that question is, you know, it was when we got kicked out the first time. So we developed a strategy of being quick and, um, you know, there was one point where we needed to get evidence that people were stirring chemicals with these open vats with, and, and, and just, I mean, you know, big, dangerous, you know, big vats of dangerous chemicals. And I would stick out uh, if I was to go into one of those places and try to interview people. And Euclides very bravely volunteered to go in so that we could document that. And I wonder, Euclides, uh, if you could tell the story about that day that you went to uh, to record and take pictures in a, like a, a three minute stop, I think. And I was worried about you the whole time. Um, uh, the day they was like uh, moving the, the the big tank of uh, uh, pesticide. Yeah, yeah, that was um, um, I thought was a very a uh, uh, milk. I thought I thought was milk, but was pesticide because it's very white and very uh, light, and um, yeah, because I want video and picture. And I saw the guy there because the, uh, uh, there is a, a Zeus that said, hey, Euclides, tomorrow morning, very early in the morning, you have to follow them if you want to see that in the ground. So I get up very early in the morning. <laughs> I hide myself in the middle of the sugar cane. When, when the, the cars, they, they bring all of the gallons and all of that stuff to work in the ground, so I follow them. I give them that distance just to, uh, they don't have time to stop me or something. 
because I give them like a 20 minute to have everything down and, and wop in the gallon and mix everything. And I just go there, went there and just have some videos. And I was talking to the guys like, oh, uh, que es eso? Eso es que es, es pesticida? Si, sí, pesticida. Si, sí, okay. But they don't know who am I, if I'm a journalist. Or, I think there was uh, one guy in the whole group who knows who am I. But he said, Euclides, you have to hurry up if you, uh, because if I will both uh, find you here in this place, taking pictures and making videos, you could have, you could be in trouble. So I made that, I, I, made, I made the picture and I just uh, come out of that place. But I feel, you can feel the uh, very um, uh, uh, warm energy, uh, una energía muy caliente y peligrosa. It, it, because doing journalism in the uh, Central Romana area, there is no Dominican journalist doing that in this country. It's probably the most dangerous assignment right now in the Dominican yeah, Republic. Yeah, because there is a very dangerous um, um, thing in that place. So uh, that's why the Dominican media in Dominican Republic um, doesn't do anything like investigation, a Haitian who's living in the uh, uh, um, Santa Romana Bateges to yeah. do anything there. Um, because of the experience I had before with Amy Bracken, he's a journalist who was working for the PRI, and um, uh, we did a report for uh, Jazeera. So that uh, uh, gave me um, uh, experience to uh, keep doing this. And I find this extraordinary journalist, um, Sandy Tolan and also uh, Michael, because uh, when I was on the ground looking for information, interviewing people, I um, uh, have uh, uh, many messages from Sandy and also uh, Michael to say, okay, now do this. Hey, what do you think if you do that, if you look for this information, interview these people, if you can find this? That was a very uh, a wonderful, that's a very great experience in my life. And that, um, and I can say that uh, uh, make more uh, responsible on you when you have some people like this guiding you uh, to do it very well in the ground and doing journalism. I think these two guys is great. Having worked with Michael before, I can attest to how wonderful it is to know that he has your back. Uh, Michael, you wanted to make a quick point? Yeah, we'll yeah just, just that, I mean, uh, it, we were very careful in, in these situations that, you know, essentially Sandy and Euclides were invited uh, into people's homes, you know, in, in, in terms of visiting the Bates. And we, we were very careful about this. I just want to say other thing in terms of colleagues. You know, we're really lucky. And I think for, for younger reporters to think about this, that, you know, we are following in the footsteps of amazing work that other journals have done, the Associated Press's work on forced labor yeah. in Asia, and the way in which this one thing leads to another. The Associated Press worked on uh, the seafood industry in Asia, seafood that is comes to the US. And that set in motion, uh, that spurred Congress to tweak some laws that makes it easier for US customs to block the imports of things like cotton from China or palm oil. And we really used some of that work as a guide to think about forced labor and our reporting. And it was extremely helpful. And lo and behold, I don't want to get ahead of things, but when our, when our story did come out, you know, there were calls from Congress for U.S. Customs to look into this. And we don't exactly know what's going to happen, but we can certainly thank all this earlier reporting. And it's just really useful to even reach out to some of those journalists. Typically, they're happy to chat, you know, give advice. So I just wanted to throw that out. That's a, that's a great tip. So build on each other's work rather than reinvent the wheel and start like if not, not, nobody has done anything before you got to the story. Uh, Sandy, before we move on to the aftermath of the story, because that's a very rich area, and we also have some very interesting questions in the chat. 
Um, there was a one scene that, that really uh, was very powerful when uh, you meet Raul and Raul is a worker who is in a lot of physical pain and hasn't gotten proper medical attention like most of the other workers. And you make a decision in the field like it happens to help this, uh, this person and you uh, invite them in, in the car and, and try to find medical help uh, for him. So uh, some reporters would say that that kind of um, intervention can alter the outcome of the story or the relationship uh, uh, that you would have with that subject of, of your story because maybe the person would have a sense of gratitude. Um, then other people would say that that's a no-brainer that if somebody obviously needs help, you help. And then there's the question of like, by helping and putting that person in your car, could you have endangered them more because of the surveillance? So how did you resolve that uh, conundrum? Uh, it, it is a conundrum. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a fairly famous, uh, and I don't remember the name of the scientist who did an experiment about the act of observation. Um, and his conclusion is the act of observation changes the act observed. So the notion that a journalist can, you know, put on a, a white lab coat and descend into a place and then have absolutely no, you know, I'm not, I'm just here. Don't pay any attention. I'm just writing down what you're saying and what it looks like. That's, that's a fallacy. Uh, not to say that people who would not have done what we did uh, are wrong, or people who would not have, you know, tried to see if they could help Lulu Pierre get home 30 years earlier are wrong either. It was a personal choice. Um, I, I feel like, um, you know, for journalists, uh, you don't want to affect the outcome in, in the sense of, uh, you know, becoming an advocate for a particular outcome when you're documenting what's happening. But when you're in a community with this much need and this much poverty and this little health care, and here's a man who had been, you know, making uh, himself, he's been getting sick. He found out he, he was HIV positive. He, we learned later he, was, he had tuberculosis and he needed his medicine and he didn't know how to get into this little town because nobody, you know, they, they can't afford a little scooter to go, you know, barely can afford a scooter. So we said, well, we're coming out to do some interviews and when we leave, we can take you into the town. Um, you know, just, we'll give you a ride. And it just so happened that that was the second time that we got kicked out. Um, and, and so there was another, another guard, another time. And that was right when we were going to give Raul a ride. Um, and so we didn't change our plan and he jumped into the back of the car and we were careful as we could be to protect him. And then we invited him for something to eat and he wasn't actually hungry and he, he went back. Uh, and so, you know, and then later we learned, um, that he was, he had been really sick. And when Euclides went to find him just in, in advance of, of uh, our, my third trip, um, Euclides, you can say what, what you learned um, unless you'd like me to summarize it. Um, so I, I get an, and focus it because someone was okay. Like uh, I can I can continue. I mean, basically, when Euclides went to find Raul because we were going to interview him again to see how he was doing, we learned that he had died, and this became um, a very important. I mean, first of all, it was tragic and 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 terrible. And one of his neighbors took us out to the graveyard, where he had been put in an unmarked grave with just a wooden stick, no cross, no name, no nothing. And that became part of our story, um, but it was also a, a kind of a, 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 an actual event and a, and a metaphor for the an anonymity that so many of these workers have and how they're treated as disposable people. Let's and it's an incredibly with... powerful, sorry, it's an incredibly powerful part of the radio piece. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's real, it's real life. You know, you never know what's gonna happen and that's really sad and real. We have really good questions in the chat, but uh, before we go to them, I want to ask uh, Euclides uh, to tell us a little bit what was for him like um, after the publication of the story. Things became really challenging for you um, living in the Dominican Republic. So um, tell us what you, you feel comfortable sharing in this forum. <clears throat> we can hear you. 
Ah, okay. Now, after the, the um, publication, um, I'm going to talk uh, uh, in general what happened, but is that time yet to publicize uh, something about this? I mean, uh, I saw that uh, we are recording, right? Yes. Yeah, so we are, this is public, this is this is a public forum, so uh, you can share whatever you are comfortable sharing in a public forum, knowing that this, this uh, recording will be accessed by anybody who wants to access it once it's posted on the website. Yeah. As I was uh, saying at, um, in the middle of the, my conversation, um, I had been underground um, working for Ayuzera, uh, with Amy Bracken in, um, in, in 2015, uh, but was not like that. So uh, that um, history did not have the impact that um, the last uh, publication have um, uh, created. Um, after the uh, um, Mother John and we feel uh, publication, I had to um, leave my, I had to leave my home, my home, me and my one years old uh, boy, uh, child, Axel, he was one years by that time, and also my wife. We have been, we, 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 um, we was out of our house uh, for around three months old. Uh, around almost uh, four months out of our home because we have recommendation from the um, um, a CPG about um, how they see the situation in terms of uh, security and the power that the company have. We have to be out of it, our house, uh, not using our car even to use our credit card because they could find us if they want mm. to do that, if we don't follow the recommendations. So yeah. we did all of that. But um, a, when I had from my source the information about seven vehicles from the company was in the Bate where we used to be um, talking to the people about the situation at the bat in the bate, so um, they practically make a, a headquarter there, like a una base militar. Yeah. Uh, they, they militarize the bate. So, so I, if I could just add that that I mean this situation, uh, you know, it, it, Euclides and his family paid a big price, um, and he can tell you, or he's told me, that he you know, what what he's proud, as he should be, of, of what we've done. But the Committee to Protect Journalists, as well as people from our own, our own colleagues, determined that the level of threat was such that he had to go into hiding. And this is unusual, but not so rare. And I just, you know, I've, I've shared this with some of my colleagues, not all the specifics, some of my students at USC, um, and uh, they've met Euclides virtually, a few of them. Um, and I just want to say that Euclides, I, I'm so grateful to you for your courage and for, and so sorry for what you've had to put up with as I was safe here in Los Angeles when you were uh, going through all of this. And my heart has always been connected to you, uh, especially after, after that happened. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Euclides, uh, for sharing that with us and for, for your courage uh, all throughout this ordeal and this reporting. Uh, and also kudos to all of you yeah. for creating a very equitable partnership uh, all the way through from sharing bylines to sharing planning and, and also sharing the, the aftermath as much as it can be shared because the only one who is physically there is Euclides, but I know that Sandy and, and Michael and others have worked hard to, to try to bring support. Uh, so how do we, yes, Euclides, you wanted to say something? No, just to add, 
uh, during the time I was out of my house with the, me, my small family, I did not uh, never feel alone because um, uh, Michael, Sandy, and people from Reveal was very, very on my back uh, to know what's happening now, where you were, how do you feel. Sandy, I think he did not sleep very well for those days. Uh, I was out of my home with this um, uh, threat, uh, death threat on me. So uh, for now, I cannot say it's totally, I'm totally free to do what I want or whatever I want or to go to Central Romana, to the batallas and report uh, freely. I mean, I cannot do that, but uh, little by little, we are going to uh, uh, normalize our life and to be able Thank you. to uh, uh, interview people and make journalism. That's why, because because the the the, is, uh, the light journalism doesn't change anything. I mean, uh, uh, something happened, accident, blah blah blah. It's good, but that journalism doesn't change. The uh, investigation journalism that uh, Pulitzer Center support, and also the Center for the Investigation Reporting, and also um, um, uh, support, and, and Michael is here, he can say that. Uh, yeah, that's the journalism that changed things for the people, more vulnerable people, what we want. That's journalism, investigation journalism, change thing. And now that you speak uh, of change, after the story, uh, there were calls from uh, Congress, there were calls, you know, to um, uh, start investigations. Uh, uh, there was also action from the Department of Labor. Um, Michael and Sandy, I don't know if you want to comment a little bit, like, um, do you think that uh, we will see any real change uh, after those calls, which were impressive at the time, but what now? If, if I may just go first, Sandy. I mean, there, I think there's certainly a correlation between the challenges Euclides faced and the impact. I mean, these are high stakes, as Sandy mentioned. These are millions and millions and millions of dollars at stake here with these sugar imports. Um, you have a, a, a very powerful family corporation, the Pontools of Florida, who control uh, directly or indirectly the world's largest uh, uh, refinery network, a sugar refinery network. So th this is these are big interests at, at stake. And as I mentioned, you know there have been calls for the U.S. Customs to look into this to possibly uh, block imports of sugar from Central Romana. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I also want to add that it's one of those odd things in journalism. You you release an investigation, and soon after. There, you, you realize there were other investigations uh, uh, also underway, and, and not long after we published, the Washington Post came out with an important story uh, that was connected to the Pandora Papers, and also uh, Jacobin did some fine reporting. So there was a lot coming out in a short period of time, and and, and clearly people in Congress were paying attention. I would just add to that that we we know through our reporting that there have been multiple visits. Um, from federal agencies, uh, the State Department, Department of Labor, other federal agencies. Uh, the embassy has gone to check on the situation. This is all sparked by uh, our reporting as well as some of the others that Michael mentioned. Um, and even one of our stories about the destruction of Abate uh, was linked to our reporting because uh, when the embassy was coming out to see this particularly horrific Bate, it was one of the worst we went to, called Oyo de Puerco, which, which translates roughly as pig hole. Um, they destroyed it four days before the U.S. was going to come to visit, almost like a destruction of evidence. So um, we know that we've had impact. You know, this is not a matter of boasting. It's just, it's incredibly gratifying because most of the times you do your stories and you, know, you, don't, you don't hear any echo at all. And so, you know, every now and then it, it, something happens and it's incredibly gratifying and there could be a lot more news ahead. We don't know yet. And, and just to add, Marina, sorry to interrupt. There, there have been pledges by the government of the Dominican Republic to uh, increase wages, to maybe get those overdue pensions paid, you know, the, the, the president of Puerto Rico has stated these things. So maybe there will be movement oh, on the ground. Ultimately, 
sorry, Dominican Republic. And so maybe it is, um, you know, ultimately will this Im favorably impact the lives of these, these Haitian families? That's the big question. Um, yes, it could be this. Uh, Michael, uh, yeah, I, I saw the um, like um, uh, re resolution about increasing the, the wages for the uh, cane cutters. But according to some people that I have been talking to, and also Jesus Nunez, um, who is the, the uh, uh, spokesman for the Cañeros, um, they are not, um, um, is not reflecting those, uh, this increased uh, wages in the paycheck. It's just still being the same. Because, you know, there is a, a discrimination in this. Um, they increase only for the people who have ID cards. Yeah. If you have resident, if you have right, um, right, um, Dominican ID, they increase your paycheck because you could go to the uh, labor minister ministry and 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 um, and um, make a comment about the situation. But if you are a migrant people here right now in Dominican Republic, actually, um, mm -hmm. there is a massive deportation. And also the immigration agents getting inside of the Haitian houses to take people out of the homes and to deport it to Haiti. So you can imagine that um, um, you're working for the whole week and they grab you Thursday and you don't have your paycheck for Friday because in the sugar cane they pay Fridays. So um, these migrant people working in the sugar cane, they don't want to go out of the bate because if they come out of the bate, they they are afraid to yeah. come out of the bate because the immigration yeah. agents are very aggressively in this um, um, administration, very aggressively. Um, Thank you, please. Um, um, like I any, want any anyone else. Anyone I want to lift like an important stuff. question that connects with what you are saying, Euclides, and connects with this idea of the Central Roman and the San Jose being kind of like a state within the state, which is something that we heard in the reveal piece. So Paula Dwyer, um, our colleague, asked, as a longtime business journalist, journalist, the Van Hoos have been the antagonist in many stories I have read and sometimes help report and write, including how they use their profit to help uh, elect and lobby members of Congress for sugar subsidies. Why do you think the Van Hoos have been able to do these things for so long with apparent impunity? And what more uh, can or should journalists do? Who wants to take that one? Uh, I could start with that. I think I, I, if, if I could just- the old bases. Okay, go ahead, Sandy. Sorry. Um, so, I, I mean, one, it's very true that journalists have been covering this. I, in, in some of the research, I went back to a Wall Street Journal piece written by Jane Mayer, who's been with The New Yorker for as long as I can remember. She wrote it like 35 years ago in 1986 about the Van Hools. You know, there was a famous piece in Vanity Fair called In the Kingdom of Big Sugar. Um, what we wanted to do, I mean, it, part of why they have been able to sustain their power is they very smartly, you could say, um, have one brother who's a Republican and one brother who's a Democrat. Um, and they, they basically sugar each uh, side of the political aisle. And they have spent tens of millions of dollars in political contributions and lobbying and uh, as part of that, they get what's called the U.S. Sugar Program, which basically boosts the price of a pound of sugar by 10 cents or more, lately more per pound. So the U.S. price is higher than the world market price. A 10 cents doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about millions of tons, it adds up fairly quickly. And so be, the the for most consumers, they, they don't really care if they're going to spend another 20 bucks a year on sugar, but these sugar producers get millions. So the, the political system has sustained it. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do was show not only that situation, but obviously the conditions that 
uh, what the price that people locally pay. Now that has also been done, but what we wanted to do is connect those two things and as Michael said, show the supply chain so that, you know, uh, there was someone, uh, Cheryl and Eiffel from the um, uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, tweeted uh, right before uh, Halloween, uh, 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 one, of our, one of our pieces and said, think about where your sugar comes from. And that's really what we wanted to do um, is connect all three of those, the conditions, the profits, and then how it comes home to us in our Halloween uh, candy or in our, our sugar that we stir into our coffee. And one of, of uh, our uh, listeners here want to know, uh, Euclides, what's the complicity of the Dominican government? I don't know if you want uh, in, in this whole uh, situation. I don't know. You mean, uh, they mean the, um, La complicidad uh, del gobierno. From, from Central Romana to with the state, with the, with the government. Yeah, yeah. So does the government intervene? Does the government look the yeah. other way? You know, uh, uh, this company is very uh, uh, big company. They pay a lot of money and taxes. So um, a very powerful. You know, um, there is a, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, people who want to work with Central Romana. For example, the whole city of uh, La Romana, because Central Romana, the name, the name comes from uh, the city. The city is uh, La Romana. So Central is a Central in La Romana. So uh, from 10 people in La Romana, you can find seven working directly to Central Romana and three indirectly work, uh, having benefits in some way. So you can imagine what that means for them. So if you talk to the people in, in La Romana um, uh, about Central Romana, I say, oh no, el Central Romana es el mejor compañía, la mejor empresa. Uh, but just um, five men are driving from Casa de Campo, who that on to Central Romana also is the same company. So the same owner, uh, you can find people working in the sugar cane and they don't, they don't have anything to eat today. Yeah. And Casa de Campo. Five minutes from a very um, um, a luxury place, a very expensive place owned by Cesar Romana, but you have uh, people outside of there just for five minutes driving they don't have nothing to eat. And they, they are working for Central Romana and the sugar cane. So the state is uh, part of the problem in this case. And, and they should, uh, yeah? No, no, just to add to that, uh, Euclid, is that there is a kind of revolving door, and of course that exists in many countries, including the United States. But uh, just for example, the former, uh, the, the former, uh, vice president of Central Romana was the Dominican ambassador to the US. He was the vice president of the Dominican Republic uh, and he was the foreign minister of the Dominican Republic um, because their, their interests align um, and they don't align with, with labor rights basically. And so yeah, this, you see a lot of that interest. Yeah, you know, I, there is a, a massive deportation right now in this time in Dominican Republic, but they never go very deep inside in the place where Central Romana have the uh, plantation, because they know they can they 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 cannot go into that places there, because they are Central Romana workers. Oh, so they are protected even though they they, don't have they immigration agents never go to the Central Romana um, batallas. And the um, electricity company, I interview um, uh, uh, someone, a uh, representative in that, um, CDA is the name here. And they said they don't have permission to install electricity in the Santa Romana Batallas. You can imagine that? So they don't have permission to 
um, uh, install the, the electricity in that places. But there is a, there is a, a thousand of uh, workers without electricity, without water, without uh, medication, I mean, uh, medicine for the kids and nothing. But the state should be um, um, uh, doing something for that, but they don't care about that. They just care for the um, Santa Romana paying taxes and all that said, because there is a, a, a discrimination and anti-Haitian on that too. Uh, yeah, Michael, and I, then we're going I, to start closing. I know. Um, I just want to say that in thinking about the Pond Pools, you think about the United States relationship with Dominican Republic. And, and one of our creative tensions that we faced in, you know, Sandy really wanted to get into some of that history. I mean, US invaded the DR how many times? At least twice in the 20th century, Sandy. And, and you know, the relationship between that and large US corporations and Marina, we don't, you know, I don't need to tell you about that given that you're from Argentina, but those issues go back a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of those challenges in an investigation like this is you can only barely touch into that history and yet it's there and really important. So I think if you think about the Fon Hools, you think about a larger sweep of history in terms of the US relationship to the Dominican Republic. Yeah, and you were mentioning before, it's not just so understanding that history and then also understanding the legal framework in the case of this story, both the labor laws, international and US and Dominican, and also the trade, uh, the free trade agreement to see what, you know, what to include and what not to, to provide that context to people. I want to ask you to finalize uh, just a, a quick final thought from each of you um, talking to younger generations, although you are all so young, we are all so young here, but to even younger reporters uh, who are aspiring to do international reporting, who are facing the complexities that we're all facing in these transnational stories. What is like your top advice? One tip, one piece of advice that you would give them uh, as they are se setting out to, to do their, their courageous reporting. Do you wanna go first, Sandy? be happy to um just the story always changes and you and it's interesting because you have to know when you when the story is changing and then what to do about it um the story is never exactly what you think it's going to be because otherwise why bother leaving the the newsroom or or your computer you know sometimes people want to get a story that's already preset and then they get quotes to fill in their previous their preconceptions and that's really not journalism well it's a kind of journalism but but recognizing that the story is going to change and then having the flexibility and adaptability to to go where the story really is i mean we did that realizing that we're, we're not going to find lulu pierre and this is a story that's happening now so let's do this story now so i would say just recognize be be, be ready to recognize it and and don't expect the story that you find in the field whether it's across the street or half a way around the world um, to be exactly what you thought it was going to be Michael? Build partnerships based on trust. I think that that is really was essential to this. And, and we all respected each other. Um, we had slightly different roles. And had we not, had that not worked, then I, I don't think this investigation would have been as, as successful as it was. And Euclides, your advice. Um, uh, I, I, I... Okay, because uh, soy un joven, un poco joven, es da um, profesores de periodismo aquí. You guys, um, um, journalism professor, and um, my 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 um, advice is like, let your passion lead you. It's like uh, lead you to the what you want to do in terms of if you are a journalist. And also um, uh, protect yourself in the place where you are reporting on their um, um, uh, peligro, dangers. Yes, the dangers. Yeah. Thank you, Cleo. This must happen. Journalism forever.
journalism must continue no it matter what. Yeah. And I want to finish uh, with a phrase in Spanish, with a wish in Spanish that one of our listeners wrote, and I think summarizes what we all feel today. Gracias, Euclides, por tus sacrificios y por todo el bien que has hecho al escribir esta historia. Muchísimas Thank you, gracias. Euclides, for your sacrifices and for all sí. the good that you have done uh, reporting and writing this story. Sí, y quiero también darle la gracia a Sandy que ha confiado su compañerismo y también a Michael por uh, eh, permitirme estar dentro de la historia y también colaborar con, con, con todo esto que ha sucedido. I want to say thank you and especially to Sandy who accepted me as a friendship and also partner in the ground interviewing people. We have really, um, above all, we have really enjoyed the ground when we are there. Um, because I say again, uh, Sandy have a very um, warm um, energy, energy. And um, yeah, just make the team very strong, even despite the, the difficulties in the ground. And thank you, Michael, for um, um, give me the opportunity to work in the very important um, um, uh, investigation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was an honor also for uh, my organization, the Pulitzer Center, to be able to support this work. We admire uh, what you have done. Thank you for uh, showing the way of how equal partnerships uh, can be done, how we can do journalism different uh, differently with uh, radical collaboration and trust. And uh, here is for more courageous reporting, here is for more impact, because I think that uh, the best is still to come. And we're going to probably see it in the next few months. Uh, so with that and uh, uh -huh. lots of gratitude, I will um, pass it on to Patty to say the final goodbye. Okay. Right. Thank you, Marina. Great job. It's great seeing you all. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye.